Okay, I'm excited because today we have a topic that is very close to my own experience. I was just asked the other day what I would do to start my fitness journey again if I had to start it again as a dude over 40. And I just started spewing stuff, basically. I just threw a bunch of stuff in my notes. I actually had to cut this early. My editor told me earlier this week that my videos are just too long. <laughs> and unfortunately, I think this is gonna be another long one because there's just way too much stuff to say on this subject. Way too much stuff, great stuff. I had to leave a bunch of stuff out, but I put only my best stuff in here that hopefully if you're a dude over 40 who has more money than time, you know, or just is short on time and happens to have some resources and, and other kind of things to help him orbiting his life, maybe you can cobble together from what I'm going to give you today something to, you know, get your fitness journey off the ground. And this is, you know, going to cover everything from not just stuff to do in the gym, but how to measure it, how to eat, basically how to give yourself the best chance for success as a guy over 40 who is wanting to get back in shape or into shape for the first time in their life. First up, you're gonna to wanna to get a baseline. I've talked about this before, but you really wanna understand kind of like the before photo. So, you know, in addition to literally taking a before photo, and I'm a big advocate for photos and I'll cover that a little bit later on, you should go get a, basically a professional diagnostic, if you will. And I've mentioned this before, but DEXA scan is probably the best of the best. It will give you everything from your bone density to like your visceral fat distribution, your body fat, all that kind of stuff. But the, probably the key thing it will give you is your basal metabolic rate. So how many calories you are burning at rest or how many calories you're burning for your particular lifestyle, whether that's sedentary or somewhat active or active or what have you. There are cheap ways to get this kind of information. You can get it online through various calculators. Um, some are better than others and I'll try to link to one uh, if I can in the description. But basically that DEXA scan, it's you know gonna be like 100, 150 bucks depending on where you live. It's the kind of thing you're going to want to do every six to 12 months if you can afford it. Um, but that'll give you the most accurate progress tracking. And at the outset, it'll give you a great snapshot of actually where you are. I actually just went and did this with my cousin. He had never done one before, but he's a little bit overweight. Uh, so, um, but he's still, you know, he looks great, looks great. But he's an older guy. He's uh, 55, I think, um, 54. And uh, is, you know, a good almost 100 pounds heavier than I am, but he's much taller than I am too. So anyways, it provided, the DEXA scan provided a fantastic before snapshot for him. And that's what you want to get right off the bat uh, to give yourself kind of an insight into where you're starting, basically. And you'll notice with a lot of these things, I'm going to start well in advance of the gym. Because, you know, if you're over 40, you want to set yourself up for success here. So... We're going to start laying the foundation outside of the gym before you even show up and spend any amount of time in the gym. I want to make sure you know where you're at and you have all the factors set up for success. So the very next thing on that list is, of course, your diet. And if you don't get your shit together diet-wise, don't even bother going to the gym. You cannot outwork a shitty diet. You just can't. So if you're not committed to at least somewhat getting your shit together, and by that I mean being able to keep your calories somewhat in check six days of the week, let's say, uh, and that seventh day, not blowing it by thousands and thousands of calories, but you know, maybe a bit of a cheat that's allowed because we don't, we're not really into dirty bulking here. Uh, you're just wasting your time if you're putting on a bunch of extra weight. So, you know, that means keeping your calories in check and it also means hitting your protein macros. And those really are the two major things, calories and protein. Macros, they can get way too complex. Uh, I know when I first started working with macros, I was fixated on hitting like my fat macro, my protein macro, my carb macro, I would just be microing it down to the last, you know, digit or whatever. It Give me a break. Doesn't matter. But you do have to be committed to hitting your protein macros if you are going to be trying to put on muscle. Usually, you've heard this many, many times before, but that's usually a gram of protein per gram of body weight. That can vary a bit. If you are obviously like 300 pounds, you probably don't need to be taking in 300 grams of protein so you can kind of adjust that downward a tiny bit but you'll get some good macros out of that dexa scan step if you manage to do that at the beginning or you know using an online calculator like i said and that will give you your kind of macros that you're trying to hit if you are fortunate enough to have a bit of extra resources like many of us do in our 40s make it easy on yourself and use a meal delivery service to get at least one or two of your meals every day 
uh, or do meal prepping. I've done both. I currently do a meal delivery service. When I meal prepped, I mean, they weren't as good as this meal delivery service, but they at least gave me what I needed in the house, yeah, ready for me to eat all the time, making good choices. I'm really lazy, so whatever's in front of me, I'll eat. And when I have, you know, obviously I have kids around, <laughs> and so it becomes harder to make good choices. If you are hungry, you will go to the things that kids like to eat, uh, you know, the chicken nuggets or whatever, and they will not be the things that you should be eating. So do yourself a favor, get a meal delivery service so you can at least check off one or two meals a day uh, that will have the right macro uh, makeup for what you're after. Basically protein dominant or protein heavy meals so you can take care of that. Also find some uh, smart snacks that work for you. you know, this can kind of be depressing, but uh, for me, um, Caramel chip rice cakes, those little Quaker things are about 60 calories each and they function as little desserts to me. Uh, that sounds pathetic, I know, but um, they're, you know, obviously they're, probably, they're entirely carbs really, maybe a tiny bit of fat in there, but I can sort of nibble on one of those when I've done a meal and I want to tell, you know, you, you have that dessert signaling that your body often is just conditioned to need and it'll you know tell my body that hey you're done eating now and that's fantastic you've had your little treat the other thing i use if i wanted to like have a much more drawn out treat is uh costco frozen sliced strawberries basically two two and a half cups of that comes to about 100 calories and i sprinkle splenda on it it's just a huge bowl and because they're frozen I have to work through it very slowly. And obviously, like, it's, you know, it takes, it hits my body because it's, like, cold and, you know, you I don't believe what you want about need or your body needing to heat up to burn calories. I don't think it, it, the benefit would be marginal at best. But the point is, it slows me down. It's a great snack. They're sweet. It's only 100 calories. Obviously, it's pure carbs, but that's okay. It's fruit. It's not so bad. So, yeah, find some smart snacks like that that you can live with to help your diet. And like I said, just simplify that diet so that you're just primarily focused on hitting your protein and calorie goals every single day. You can find some really protein efficient foods. Like I use, um, well, basically three things. Like, so let's just say I have, you know, over indexed a little bit on carbs. That's usually the case in my day if I decided to give myself a little treat. I wanted to have the little pecan oat milk latte or whatever at Starbucks, pure carbs. But now I'm a little bit behind in my protein macros for the day. So get yourself some really protein efficient foods that you really enjoy. For me, it's extra lean ground turkey from Costco that I can bundle up into 500 gram uh, frozen bags and cook you know, a, every day, every second day or whatever. So eating like 100 grams of that, I think it's about 120 calories, and I'm just looking at my notes here, 26 grams of protein or something, very uh, protein efficient. Other good examples would be 0% um, fat Greek yogurt, which I think if I remember correctly is about 17 grams of protein and 100 calories, I think, for a three-quarter cup serving. And then obviously whey protein, just like 24 grams of protein in 120 calories. So these things you can, obviously I mix like the, the whey protein with the Greek yogurt. Uh, I also throw creatine in there. I'll talk about that in a bit. But basically you can use those foods to kind of catch up on your protein throughout the day if you've kind of gone too far into the carbs or fat territory. So get yourself some good, I don't know, they're not really cheats, um, but hacks like that basically. And then the other thing I would highly, highly recommend if you're now, you know, a dude in his 40s, trying to make sure you're making the right choices with regard to your fitness journey, don't drink your calories. It's just such a easy way to blow through a shit ton of calories. I used to really like beer many, many years ago. Thankfully, I don't anymore because that's extremely high calorie, but I still do like cocktails. And to that end, I'll get myself gin. Gin, depending on what source you look at, is about 60 to 80, maybe 90 uh, calories per ounce, I believe. So gin and diet tonic, diet tonic, because regular tonic is super high in sugar. You know, that's the kind of stuff you can get away with a little bit. Drinking is not, not a fantastic idea. It's going to obviously like suppress your natural uh, hormone, testosterone production, that sort of stuff. It's a depressant. I mean, you know, we all know the downsides of alcohol, but the best diet is the one you can stick to. So try to make these substitutions in a way that allows 
for longevity. It allows you to stick to this diet long term. And that's what we're trying to do here. The other thing on the still to stay on the diet tip because it is so, so, so important, get over your aversion to artificial sweeteners and dive headlong into zero calorie drinks. I hate to say it, but uh, they are s such a good treat replacement. My fridge is full of Dr. Pepper Zero, uh, you know, ginger ale zero, um, all sorts of crazy drinks that are all zero calorie. So yeah, a lot of artificial sweeteners, but it obviously lets me keep my liquid intake quite high and gives me that sort of treat type feeling that I really love because I'm a huge sweet addict. And so get yourself stuff like that. That's all the zero calorie, you know, I have the zero calorie, uh, syrup as well um, that I put on top of my 0% Greek yogurt that has the, you know, the whey protein or whatever. So you can see how this all comes together to make it not quite so bad to be able to stick to your diet here. The other thing I should mention is if you are a big fan of, um, let's say cereal, that's going to be a tough one, but you can find some good cereals like Vector and that sort of stuff that are high protein. Uh, and now obviously there are tons of protein cereals you can do as well. They're usually higher priced though. But if you are a fan of, let's say, milk in your coffee, uh, like lattes, where you're using a lot of milk in your coffee, definitely try going to almond milk. We're talking a quarter of the calories of regular milk, maybe less, I believe. I think uh, regular milk would be about 120 calories per cup. That's 2% milk. And I think almond milk is about 30 calories per cup. So literally a quarter of the calories. And yes, I know it doesn't taste as good, but again, get over it. Like, you know, you adapt to these things over time, mostly. I mean, I can't say that occasionally it doesn't, you're not reminded of how good things taste when you have like a real milk latte or something. But most of the time you get over most of it. <laughs> and that allows you to keep your calorie intake for the stuff that really matters, not drinks. Okay, next on the list, before we even get to the gym, next on the list for us old guys with, you know, more money than time, is find yourself a good MD. Find yourself a good doctor. I have one. I've had a few over my time. You know, some have been great, some have been not so great. The one I started with was great. Uh, he retired because Canada and healthcare and all that stuff. And what a shame. But uh, the one I'm with now is even better. I can text him on signal, uh, which is amazing. I can get what I need just sort of, uh, if it's a prescription or something, just like, you know, automatically just fax to my pharmacy. It's all very amazing. A great use of my time, basically. I pay a small amount for that privilege, uh, but it's well worth it, um, especially in Canada where it's tough to find a good MD, tough to find a good doctor at all. But the very first thing you're going to want to use that doctor for is a comprehensive uh, blood labs, basically a comprehensive uh, panel of uh, blood tests. And uh, that should include a hormone panel, obviously, uh, because uh, in your 30s as a dude, hormones are declining, your testosterone's declining like pretty much every year from your mid to late 30s onward. And I, you know that is gonna be a thing. Like I will hopefully try to put up some before and after photos of before I jumped on TRT and had been training for off and on my entire life and had been training with a trainer for like a couple years prior to that, like three, four days a week, that before photo versus just, you know, six months into TRT and that after photo. And it's dramatic. So again, this is gonna be a conversation with your doctor and it's gonna be relative to whatever your blood panel results come back uh, with whether or not you actually need hormone replacement, TRT, whatever you wanna call it. But as a dude, I can tell you that you know, I'm 49 now, solid testosterone levels make effort feel good, basically. <laughs> so you will feel good in the gym. You will feel good lifting heavy and doing heavy, heavy weight workout workouts and you will see those results for, uh, if your hormone levels are in the right place. And that is 100% worth checking into before you ever set foot in a gym. Obviously, I'm being a bit facetious. Go ahead and set foot in a gym if you want, but let's maximize our results and let's make sure we are working with a fantastic doctor who can coach us through everything our body needs to make the most of that time in the gym. And as I mentioned before, I use an app called Ornament to store all of my uh, blood panel results and so I can look at them longitudinally, i.e. over time, and see how certain things I've done in terms of diet and supplementation 
uh, and workouts and that sort of stuff have corresponded to results in my blood labs. I also, because I have one kidney, have a nephrologist, which in layman's terms is a kidney specialist. And he obviously has a battery of tests for me. And I often, you know, I further reason for me as an old dude to work with doctors is because I have to keep an eye on kidney function relative to the amount of protein I take in and additional supplementation, that sort of stuff. So I imagine all of us at this age have various issues that need help. I obviously have a physio that I work with for shoulder issues a lot, doing intermuscular uh, stimulation and that sort of stuff, needles basically. So find yourself this uh, medical team basically uh, to help you on your journey. Okay, next up is finding a good personal trainer. Now, if you haven't spent a lifetime in the gym and maybe you're not sure about form on certain exercises, you can get this information from YouTube, you can get this information from apps. Uh, you know, obviously you can definitely work without a trainer, but if you've got the means, if you've got the resources, the money or whatever to hire a personal trainer, um, I did it for a number of years. I did it in my 20s, 30s, 40s. Uh, I did it long into my 40s after I really didn't need one anymore, but he was just a, and still is a good friend. And it was great motivation. But the bottom line is it's now left me with a fantastic, if I do say so myself, awareness of form and the importance of it. I remember when I went into that personal trainer, um, my most recent one, I haven't now gone for a couple of years or more, two and a half years. Uh, but I remember way back, I think it was in 2016, when I started seeing him, my primary goal was injury prevention. So it was not to get huge, it was not any, you know, strength, any of that. It was literally stay healthy, stay uninjured. And that's what we did. We built a large uh, amount of programs over the years around exactly that. And I still apply most of those learnings to what I do. And so if you can afford to get a personal trainer to build that solid foundation, fantastic. Uh, if not, there are a host of resources, obviously, on YouTube. You can probably find what you need. But what you're going to want to do is uh, stick to the meat and potatoes, what um, my old trainer used to call it. The meat and potatoes is the stuff that's been proven over years. Uh, it's the you know, compound lifts like squats and deadlifts. It's the you know big muscle stuff like uh, like bench press, uh, curls, uh, shoulder press, overhead press, whatever you want to call it. You don't need to get fancy. You'll see a ton of stuff out there on weird, fancy workouts, especially on YouTube and you know, even worse on Instagram or other social media. Ignore it. Um, you just need the bread and butter and you need a solid diet and, and you can get most of your results from that. That's what you're going to do basically from a workout plan perspective. Uh, lots of options there, but stick to the basics and just you know know that you know, patience is your best weapon here. Um, and as old people, <laughs> as old dudes, like if we've learned nothing, we've learned patience because we've been around for a while and we know that you can, consistent effort over time is going to deliver those results. So just be patient and consistent and, you know, don't feel like you got to change up these workouts every month, two months, three months, because you don't really. You, know, you just need to can focus on progressive overload consistently lifting more than you did last week or last month, whatever frequency you want to start upping your weights at, and then those results will come. And because you're short on time uh, and you like, you know, maybe you're like me, you like to multitask. Uh, I've for the last only about six months or so started doing cardio. <laughs> I mean, I get cardio in a bunch of different fashions. Uh, I also walk a ton. I walk, you know, anywhere from six, eight, 12,000 plus steps uh, a day usually because I work from home and I get out and whatever. But if you're going to get your cardio in a gym, you can do low intensity steady state cardio, which will let you watch YouTube, which will let you be on your phone, whatever you need to do. Basically, that's what you want to do. You want to keep your heart rate between 120 and 140 beats per minute. Probably even just over 120 is just fine. That's zone two cardio. That's fat burning cardio. That's going to do something for your heart. And it's also, like I said, going to burn a bit of fat. Do that 30 minutes every time you work out. So three, four or five times a week if you can. Uh, and that's more than enough. There's your cardio taken care of, basically. You don't have to overthink it. That's obviously treadmill or elliptical. When I'm talking about that zone two cardio, that uh, 120 to 130, 140 beats per minute cardio. And the great part about low intensity steady state cardio is it doesn't interfere with your lifting. And again, because we are older dudes, 
You want to minimize the amount of stress you're putting on your body. It's all about the stimulus to fatigue ratio. And obviously, the more you are fatiguing your body, the less stimulus you're going to be able to give it via vis-a-vis -vis, uh, weightlifting, basically. So I generally avoid things that are going to break myself down when I'm not in the gym. And I prioritize all that stimulus for weightlifting and keep the rest of my time um, relatively optimized around things like heart health and cardio and that sort of stuff. So now how do you maximize your time actually in the gym? Well, for me these days, the best way to maximize my time is to do fewer exercises. So maybe I'll only do four exercises, but I'll do more sets of each exercise. So I'm able to find a machine, find a, you know, a bench, whatever you know, area I'm working out in, you know, a set of bar, uh, dumbbells rather, and essentially camp out there. That sounds worse than it is, but you know, do four to six sets of that instead of you know, uh, three sets and doing more exercises. Because what I find is in busy gyms, I'm more likely to run into people that are using the machine or using the weights that I want to use. And now I've got a weight or I've got a reprogram or something. Uh, so if I can keep it to fewer exercises and more sets, the volume, that is the overall amount of weight I'm lifting, it remains the same. And that's really all we care about is the volume when you're dealing with hypertrophy, which is like muscle growth. You are just trying to maximize the volume you're lifting um, in a healthy way. Obviously, I'm going to keep it to hypertrophic rep ranges, which are, you know, let's say eight and above. I mean, could some people say six and above? I would say eight and above. Usually I'm eight to 12 reps because I get bored at anything over 12 and maybe I can go to 15 on some things. But I keep those rep ranges in the hypertrophy rep range and then I just up the weights when it becomes easy and I start doing more than 12 or I decrease the weights if it's getting too hard and I'm doing less than eight. So you're gonna be doing, you know, four exercises, let's say six sets of each exercise, not including a warm up set and uh, eight to 12 reps of uh, in each set. That would be kind of my prescription for an older dude that wants to, uh, you know, lessen their exposure to injury. Cause obviously if you are lifting more for strength and you were trying to, you know, do four to six reps, let's say of a heavier weight, you are mo more prone to injuring yourself. And we really don't want that. Um, if you're anything like me and you're just vain and you're trying to put on muscle and look good, you really care about hypertrophy results, not strength results as much. So I'm never going to be the strongest guy in the gym. Uh, and that's not my goal. So I don't really need to be down in those four to six rep ranges. I need to be up higher, which is also safer for me and my joints and just staying injury free, basically. Now, another tip in terms of gym efficiency is uh, if you can uh, to superset exercises where possible. Um, and the gym I'm at now is moderately busy, so I'm not able to do this all the time. But what this means is you are doing, uh, you know, an exercise for muscle group A on one machine and an exercise for muscle group B on another machine. And these are two muscle groups that uh, don't uh, that sort of counter each other, let's say. So I could do like, you know, calf raises on one machine and curls uh, like, um, you know, seated on a bench somewhere like dumbbell curls. Obviously, those two muscle groups have nothing to do with one another. So I don't have to rest between doing them. I could rest overall, like, but I can go right from one to the other and thereby shortening my workout, basically. If you're short on time, like many of us are, that'd be the way to shorten your workout. It doesn't happen very often for me anymore because I used to work out at a semi-private gym where that was more possible. Not so possible now. Uh, it's a little bit of a busier gym. Most frequently I can superset like an ab exercise with something I'm doing because that happens to be free. But often everything's too busy um, station-wise, machine-wise for me to really superset, so I can't. And I'm just gonna touch really quickly on um, the basics in terms of supplementation and water. <laughs> uh, there's obviously a whole world of supplements you could be taking, but the only ones that really work, it's just going to be water and creatine, quite frankly. You can do other stuff. I talked about hormonal supplementation, that sort of stuff, but the off-the-shelf stuff that works is creatine and water, and that's it. And the water's there to help you process all your protein intake, and the creatine gives you that intramuscular fullness, the water retention in your muscles. It's not actually subcutaneous. It's not under your skin. So you can still look cut if you're at that kind of body fat level, like 15% or less. You can still look cut while supplementing creatine. It'll just make you look fuller. It'll make the muscles look fuller, which is, I mean, who doesn't want that, basically? And, you know, they say five milligrams of creatine, or sorry, five grams of creatine. Daily, I take 10. Uh, you will just... The, you know, the excess creatine, you'll just piss out. It doesn't matter. So, you know, overdose, quote unquote, on creatine, you'll be fine. Um, and water, 
I usually try to drink four liters plus a day. Uh, in the past, I've bought a giant four liter like gallon jug that I would just make sure I finished. Now I just have a slightly more discipline and make sure that I drink my liter and a half in the gym and have a variety of other zero calorie drinks and overall hit f about four liters a day so that my kidneys can process all the, pro all the protein rather. And finally, now that we did all the before, we, you know, in terms of like setting ourselves up for success and all the during in terms of what we do at the gym and the supplementation and the water and all that kind of stuff, the eating well, now it's time for the after, if you will. Like, how do we know we've made progress? So this is where you're going to want to take, let's say, weekly progress photos from, you know, the same angle, uh, same lighting, same camera, same, same, same. Like I wear the same pair of, there's a TMI, but underwear <laughs> every time. So you can really see the difference in how you've changed. And like I mentioned earlier, like, uh, and I showed you those before and after photos, then you can really see. Uh, ideally, you get some cool down lighting, but we, you know, I don't have that. You just, I just have this horrible bathroom head-on lighting. But nonetheless, this will let you see your change over time because we are our own worst uh, evaluator of progress. Uh, the, uh, we're looking at our body every single day, so we are not cognizant of changes as much as other people have co are cognizant of them in us or we are able to look back at photos and recognize those changes. And it is so important to recognize those changes lest you become discouraged and think that nothing has changed. And I am constantly thinking that despite tons of evidence to the contrary. You're also going to want to do a DEXA scan, like I mentioned in the, in the beginning, ideally every six months, but that can get expensive. So every year would be great. Uh, I've been able to see that my bone density has gone up year after year after year while doing DEXAs. I think I started DEXAs in 2017. Um, so that's great because that's the opposite of what usually happens as we age. Bone density usually goes down. So that's a fantastic outcome. I can also see how much muscle mass I've put on, how much visceral fat I've reduced, all that kind of stuff. And so progress photos, DEXA scan, uh, super, super useful. Obviously, you're going to have your workout tracking app. So you're going to be able to see over time how much more you're lifting than you used to be able to lift, which is fantastic. And if I could leave you with anything after dumping all this information on you, and I know it's a lot, but don't try to do this all overnight. You cannot do all of this cold turkey. <laughs> there's a bunch of stuff here, and there's even more that I've left out of this video that I will put into future videos, but it is almost impossible to do this overnight. As I mentioned before, with, with respect to diet, the best diet is the one you can stick to. The best workout plan is the one you can stick to. The best lifestyle change as a whole is going to be the one you can stick to. So if you're eating fried chicken every second night, try eating it once or twice a week to start. <laughs> like go that slowly if you need to go that slowly. If you've never, if you don't even make it to the gym, go once a week. You have to start slowly and you have to start in a way that doesn't turn you off this whole process. You can layer these things, all these improvements in over time. You don't need to do them all overnight. If I had started out my journey eating rice cakes as a treat, uh, I would not be here now. I would hate my life. You need to allow yourself time to acclimate. It's like ascending Everest. You've got to acclimate to each base camp as you go. You can't just be dropped you know, from a helicopter at the top of Everest. Actually, I'm not sure helicopters can fly that high. Anyways, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so hopefully this helps and hopefully you can use some of these items to grab onto to start your fitness journey. I know that you know maybe you've spent a lot of years raising kids like I did and now you've, you know, they're a little bit older, you got a bit of time, not much time, but you got a little bit more resources and hopefully this has given you at least the beginnings of a path to get back on or get on for the first time that fitness journey um, over 40. Okay, I hope that was helpful. Uh, I'm Adrian Crook. Uh, feel free to like and subscribe if you found this at all entertaining or ideally helpful. I think we're up to 102 subscribers. It was a big week. We are really, truly blowing up. 102 subscribers, and I think we're over 200 views. So big things are happening here, and thank you to the dozens and dozens of you that have watched my videos so far. I'm really enjoying this, and I hope you are too.